James, how are you going? Going well, going well. Thank you as well, Emma. So we are both in our little lockdown venues. Yes, but it's not getting in the way of Ignite content. <laughs> no, it's not. We're, we're going to be innovative here. Well, we're probably jumping on the bandwagon and we're just going to do some online riffs. We're going to have a discussion about what's going on in the world right now with coronavirus. And we're going to talk about the implications for all of you HSE kids out there and just look at it from a more general level, more universal level. Um, talk about what we're noticing about humans and how we act and how we've responded. And we'll also talk about um, any potential threats, I suppose, but for lack of a better word, that we should be cautious of um, in this time of yeah. crisis. Yeah, for sure, which obviously links to some of the texts that you guys are studying for human experience. And I guess we'll also kind of talk about just from our personal perspective, how we're coping with the working from home, any strategies, because we're both still students ourselves. So from that kind of personal level, how to go about this COVID-19 situation and then link it to your studies more broadly. But I guess maybe before we get into it, don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already and click yes. the bell for notifications uh, for future videos. We're reaching, uh, sorry to interrupt you there, Liz. Um, I was just going to say we are reaching nearly 1,500 subscribers. So that's exciting. And yes. uh, probably this week we'll get 100,000 views on the channel. So um, exciting milestone for Ignite, uh, for yes. sure. Please do spread the word if you're enjoying it. Um, but we appreciate you spending your time on the channel. I guess we're very appreciative of the fact that despite everybody being stuck at home, does it get in the way of people watching the clips? I guess it's the perfect kind of environment to indulge in the Ignite content. So it's actually worked pretty well. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We're probably, we're one of the, um, not, not that it's anything to like gloat about, but it, it's been an online kind of resource platform. It doesn't, we're, we're fortunate enough that this kind of experience doesn't affect us all that much. It certainly doesn't affect us adversely. Um, and it also reinforces the move we made to go online. Uh, mm. I remember we used to have, um, many of you watching this probably don't know, <clears throat> initially the resources that you're consuming online, if you are part of our resource platform um, at ignitehse.com.au, there's a little, you know, <laughs> go, go visit that after. Um, <laughs> it, when we started doing those resources, there were printouts, right? We were like, you know, old school, old school printouts that we, we handed out um, alongside the workshops that we delivered and then we, we shifted it all online and kind of improved the resources uh, and made them completely online uh, and virtual based so you know it's, it was kind of a good shift um, for you know instances like this um, and thankfully it doesn't stop anyone from accessing the content yeah yeah a big shift and in fact maybe a little bit of hesitation on my behalf initially moving from the hard copies of the resources onto the online but I guess it speaks to challenges of human experience, trajectories, finding ways of overcoming them, and it's worked for the better, particularly in this context. Yeah, and I think, I think just like a good kind of starting point is, it, it's amazing, this, this kind of thing, this crisis with a, you know, the pandemic of the type that it is, um, being something to do with virus, something that's transmissible, um, and you know, they say communicable, right? Um, with the, the nature of that is, is such that it makes you reflect on the value of technology in these times, right? It does. So it does. In fact, it makes me a little bit wary about my reliance on technology to an extent, even as we're filming a Zoom video, hoping, hoping that it works out. Yeah, that's right. We're very dependent, but um, there's also an irony, isn't it? Like we probably, we probably overuse it when we don't need it in a sense, um, you know, in everyday life when things are normal. Um, and we probably revert to technology far more than we need to and we should be, when we should be embracing the real life human connections uh, and things that really are, are more fulfilling and meaningful when they're done outside of a virtual sphere. And then I, I see what you're saying. So you're kind of... Uh, yeah. Well, go on, go on. Um, ironically, now's the time where we really are dependent on technology and should look into technology and be innovative with how we can connect with each other via virtual means. It's the one time. So it's kind of like we're, we're now reflecting on it and thinking, geez, I should value the, the in-person and live interaction um, far more when I have the opportunity to do so. That's the perspective we get here. Uh, and then now we're also being forced to kind of appreciate when technology is really useful. So it's kind of helping distinguish between uh, the good and the bad for, for technology, right? Yeah, it kind of uh, a resonating quality that I just found in what you said was this meme I came across. And it was quite funny. It was sort of like, I apologise and now I'm regretting. 
<laughs> um, the, the meme was, I apologize and I regret for all of those times I lied about not being able to meet up with you. You know, this kind of thing that, you know, on your Saturday night, you may have resorted to using technology because you didn't want to get out there. But now all of a sudden you have to rely on technology wow. and somehow this paradox is that you wish you didn't have to engage with it in the same way that you have to now because we're forced yep. to. So yeah. it's, um, it's, it's it quite interesting. Yeah, it's, it's definitely an interesting uh, perspective change. Um, mm. a broadened perspective and, and, and it comes from this like paradigm shift uh, of like living in you know this isolated uh, time where you really have to look at technology differently and also look at um, the social dimension of your life differently as well and you start to appreciate you know um, time that you actually have in person with friends and family and you realize something like this could happen obviously this is like a one in a hundred years kind of thing but um, or whatever, it's, it's an anomaly, right? To, to use the words of human experience, but it's a massive anomaly. And it's not like this is gonna happen all the time, but it, it's almost a metaphor, you know, for, for life in general, that you never know when something is gonna happen, you know, the worst case death, when you're not gonna see anyone else anymore. And, or you're, you're to a point where you um, are disabled from seeing other people uh, in a meaningful way. So it really makes you cherish those, those, um, those, opportunities yeah that you maybe previously wouldn't have come to the same appreciation of and i guess that is kind of inherent in the human experience it's not until you encounter certain challenges or as you use the word anomalies um that you start to realize these parts of your character it's those challenges that provoke that and i think that's also another really interesting concept yeah definitely am i coming through? yeah my it's just started pouring out at my end and somehow that's weakened the You're good. You're good on the sentence. Yeah. Um, so let's just, what are your thoughts generally on what's going on? I mean, that was a nice little intro on that. That's something that is kind of a value change uh, that, that we're dealing with. But yeah. what else are you noticing in this kind of environment? And, and do you want to talk about the, the context a little bit more generally? Uh, yeah, I guess so. So I think where we are right now is so we've had the stricter lockdown measures that have been enforced for, I think the legislation came in three or four days ago. And I guess the point that struck me more than anything else is obviously this broadening of executive power. And by the way, when we say executive power, we know we've got you know three different arms of government, we've got your legislation, we've got your judiciary, then there's the executive, the people who enforce laws. And I guess when we think about the police as part of that branch, what really strikes me is that if I'm walking down the street or if I'm outside, a member of the executive can come up to me and question my actions um, purely because we have this threat of COVID-19 that's omniscient and kind of circulating in our context. And I guess people are now kind of compelled to obviously stay indoors. There are a list of 16 different excuses for why you can be outside your house in the legislation. Some of them a little bit gay. What was that? Sorry. I'm using one of them right now. We're using one of them right now being that yes, in case anyone wasn't clear on that. I'm the one who's stuck to the rules and stayed at home. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, I guess thinking that my life and my decisions moving beyond the boundary of my house has to fit into one of these 16 different categories. And if I breach any of those, that an officer of the state can come up to me and query that, and then I can potentially be fined. So some of these qualities about control, social interaction, your agency and your movement, the fact that this is now subject to a very powerful piece of legislation is pretty concerning. And it does make me a little bit nervous about my movements and any choices that I make. So it's definitely an unforeseen human experience that we're all encountering in a collective sense, if we want to make a couple of rubric links here. But with that, I think comes an increased sense of fear, maybe a little bit of anxiety staying inside your house. We think about emotions which arise from this experience but also you're compelled to and forced to face parts of your character that you may not previously have had to face you know yeah. how you go being under control how you are able to control your emotions being in a confined space how that might implicate your productivity all these sorts of things your relationships with your family members what kind of person you become when you can't socialize in the same way that you used to I guess these are all triggers of the circumstance being a very unique human experience. And I think that's what makes it so worthy of discussion. And it also speaks to a lot of the resonating qualities of the text that you study in human experience. Because a lot of these issues about 
imprisonment, control, a sense of governance that is now limiting your agency. They're all really enduring values and they've become of the utmost relevance in our contemporary world right now. Yeah, definitely. So many, uh, so many little points to make on that. Um, a couple of things, just in relation to the individual and the collective, uh, it's an interesting one, isn't it? I've been thinking about it today, just knowing we were going to do this. Um, there's this, there's this sense that individuals have to, to unify, right? We have, we have to unite as, as a nation and as a globe even. So on an international level and yeah. we all have to work together. Right. And, but there's this interesting tension between that collective effort and then the preservation of individual agency and consciousness and yeah, yeah sure um and basically what i'm interested in in this is this dynamic here because we need to work together as a collective but in working as a collective it almost in a funny way to work as a collective you need to then give your power and trust to a very limited amount of people these executive kind of government officials uh, you know, elect, elected officials uh, mostly, but um, but also to police and, and the kind of down the, down the stream there. But you're giving a lot of power and trust to these very kind of small institutional players, and that is the collective effort. So the collective effort is to give all the power to a few people, and what then happens is you then might be well, you face the risk of that kind of power and that trust being exploited, right? Or or going, to, it might go too far. Um, as your civil liberties become more and more restricted, you've got to maintain that heightened awareness of what's really going on. You've got to constantly be critical and you constantly have to question the motives behind it and whether it's truly rational or needed. Um, now, of mm. course, the argument there is that we leave it in the hands of the experts and they're consulting with the you know, heads of science and things like that. And, and I think that's definitely a good argument. But you know, when these political characters are coming out and saying things, it's, it's to what extent is that a direct translation of the expert advice? Ultimately, people in power are the ones who are going to make decisions. Um, and so there is this thing about we need to un unite together as a collective, but in that, uh, how much power are we actually giving up as individuals? That's right. That's right. How much power you're relinquishing and also to what extent you're relinquishing your consciousness, right? Just because it's an issue that needs to be left to the experts, that does not mean that we shouldn't question decisions being made, look at the legislation, highlight any kind of inaccuracies that have been said there are any grey areas. I think that's really important. And, and we'll come back to this, but a really specific link, I think, to Miller's The Crucible mm -hmm. and how the control in that society was looking to have individuals question their own agency and their own consciousness, which is certainly not something that you want to let go of in this particular environment yeah that's that's right we don't want to lose all the john proctors right um right. Not that i think it'll come to a matter of life or death hopefully with uh you know some kind of huge rebellion but even though life and death is very much at play in the circumstance that's right ironically it is it is a matter of life and death really and and, and this links to the next point you see them using that language uh, you you see you know i think in victoria or something someone said it's now a matter of life and death using that language and the way that media is potentially exploited and the fear that's portrayed right in the media and that's disseminated. There's so much fear. Fear is the ultimate mechanism for by impinging and uh, imparting fear on someone is the ultimate mechanism for suppressing consciousness, right? Yeah. Fear and hysteria, I would argue as well. Yeah. Yeah. Hysteria, paranoia, fear, people go crazy. And we'll talk about some of these kind of paradoxes, inconsistencies, anomalies, all these things that happen in human nature. Uh, especially in connection with the texts that are being studied uh, for the HSC mm -hmm. cohort. But uh, it, is, it is definitely interesting um, how, how we look at now, how we have to look at fear, right? And, and fear as, this, as something that we have to be really careful with um, because fear is a, an instinctive response to events like this, but the fear can be perpetuated and unnecessarily manufactured at times. Uh, and certainly the degree of the fear that's necessary can be manufactured. Uh, by mediums like the media and you just just the the general kind of language that's out there um, around this and we have to be careful about that of course yeah I think that's definitely true and I think I guess another paradox in this circumstance is the fact that the collective effort is to remain isolated from one another and I guess on a kind of symbolic level governments can become very powerful and power when individuals are reluctant to join together as the collective because the biggest threat to I guess a hierarchy is when the people who are under the control of 
the executive or of the government, um, the fact that we're kind of so disparate and we're disconnected in this sense, that weakens our collective authority as people. And I guess that's another kind of warning sign because the foundations of a democracy are power to the people. But because in this particular circumstance, our collective effort is to remain isolated and in fact, be fearful of coming into contact with other individuals on a very kind of symbolic level, I think it speaks to the potential threats that are going on in this circumstance. And of course, how fear is being maneuvered and manipulated to have people obey and listen sort of subconsciously to what's being told to them by our government. Yeah. Yeah, that's such an interesting point, the, um, the kind of idea of the physical isolation, the fact that we all have to do our part in this collective effort, but we have to do it in isolation. It, mm. it's, like we, it's like we know how, not that this is consciously happening, but it's like we know how powerful you as the nation are. We know that if you all go this way, like there's nothing we can do. And if you go that way, there's also nothing we can do. Like you're this huge force. But if we can mm. get you to all do what you want in this isolated an alienated fashion, you don't have that threat to us, right? Now, obviously, it's a good thing everyone's doing their role, and it just so happens that in these circumstances, um, the actual physical isolation is is seemingly necessary. Um, well, and I just think we really make it clear that we're not in any way challenging the importance of remaining socially isolated. I'm like, a, we're both very big candidates of working from home, social distancing, because there's nothing else that will work to flatten the curve. We're just speaking on kind of a broader conceptual level and thinking about some links that can be made to literature. But in no way would I be suggesting that everybody start getting together just to prove a point to government. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 of course not. So th these are certainly... Uh you know, every, everything points to these measures being uh, necessary at this point. We're, we're purely raising, a, raising the flag, raising the point that um, in these types of situations in history, that's mm. where people, if you've, got, if you've got people with good intentions who, uh, who are entrusted with the power that you would hope we do, then there's nothing to worry about. Uh, the point is that in, in other similar times in history when there's been moments of, of crises, then that's where we can be in a situation like we are now and then someone gets a little carried away with the power and then bad things start to happen, right? That's right. And I guess the emotion there that you're touching on is the vulnerability of the individual. As soon as we feel, as soon as we feel vulnerable to a particular concept, that's when we become easy to be manipulated because we're looking for direction. And that's when, I guess, powerful people come into power and individuals are feeling like they need that direction. And I think the notion of vulnerability is particularly poignant in this context because we're vulnerable against something that we can't really personify. Mm -hmm. The nature of COVID is that it's not tangible, it's abstract, it's this disease, we have no, it, it's part of human nature in a sense that we have no way of controlling the spread of this thing. And because of its inanimate nature, the fact that we can't kind of characterise it in a way that a nation would characterise the demonic nation against which they're in war, it's very different here because everyone is subject to this object and that kind of heightens our vulnerability and hence our need to kind of gravitate towards people in power to give us that direction because we're so directionless to something so powerful powerful in its very inanimate form yeah that's right and even even moving away from the whole like power thing and the, the government you know being wary of what's going on and i think i think that's a, a clear message we've raised and uh that people hopefully are, are aware of uh, again not to say that we think it's happening now but something just to be conscious of that's the whole point just just have awareness constantly come back and question things you know every week like what's going on is this necessary look at the facts look at look at the actual numbers that, that are being reported in terms of like cases for this instance. Like if we suddenly saw that the, the rate uh, of spread was incredibly low, let's say in, in a few months time, and we still had these, you know, draconian measures, super draconian measures in place, uh, then you might want to question whether that is, is necessary. Um, but that, that's an example of that. But I was just going to move away from that a little bit and talk about irrespective of the political kind of dimension. Um, there's an interesting, uh, a point there's some interesting issues here um, in response to the kind of what this what this event is revealing to us about our duality and what it's revealing about us in terms of the polarity of our personality as a human collective right so th this th we're, we're very bipolar as a collective uh, and I think we've, we've seen so many instances of it um, and there is this duality to our response if, if you really examine it in terms of compassion versus selfishness, uh, in mm. terms of rational uh, thinking and irrational thinking, you just see so many conflicting interests um, that are really built into our DNA. 
and we see them revealed. And you know, some some examples I was thinking about just to illustrate what I'm talking about uh, is, for instance, we know that, you know the whole toilet paper saga, right? What what you're seeing there is you're seeing people who are responding to this fear, to this threat, in an incredibly selfish way, right? Like they're if everyone just kept acting normally in terms of the way they consumed these necessities um, and we'll call it a necessity, but if everyone responded in the exact same way, then we wouldn't have any of these economic problems, these supply problems in the way that we've seen in the last few weeks where suddenly some, one person hoards, another person hoards and, and you get this hysteria and that's where the problems uh, socially that are already there worsen, right? So, there's that and then and then and then by the same token there's the people out there who are like putting their lives on the line and exposing themselves to the risk of infection and things like that so you see a whole group of people and often it could be the same person but you see groups of people who are out there risking everything you see other groups of people who only care about protecting the fort protecting their own domestic sphere uh, and they're not thinking about the collective and and there's so many inconsistencies to that behavior right because by doing that by hoarding things like that because you're panicking about what's going on, you're actually making what's going on even worse because you're causing mm. further economic and social problems. Um, so th there's some really interesting dynamics at play there. Um, and I, I was just gonna say one thing I observed as well. Uh, are you, are, there's something called the prisoner's dilemma, uh, something explored in economics, right? And it, there's basically the, the toilet paper saga, right? Where everyone's going after the toilet paper and buying like, a year's worth, it's an example of a prisoner's dilemma, right? So the prisoner's dilemma basically says that even though the optimal collective outcome here, right, is for every, let's say it's for everyone to proceed as normal with the toilet paper consumption, like don't buy any more toilet paper than you normally do, right? And that's what the directions were. And let's assume that's going to lead to the best possible outcome in that particular domain, right? Even though that's the best collective outcome, no individual, when you look at the individual, no individual is optimally incentivized to do that. Because as soon as, if all individuals do it, everyone's better off as a collective. But when you look at any particular individual, they'll just think, well, I'll just get more myself. I'll let everyone else do that. And then everyone starts to think, well, I'll just get more just in case, right? Because they're thinking for me, I'm better off if I have certainty over the long run that I'm gonna have this toilet paper for a year in case this thing carries on. So I better just do that myself, even though we know that if we all just do the same thing, it's fine. And then everyone starts thinking like that. That's the selfish domain because they think I'll be better off, right? But if everyone thinks that way, then suddenly you're at the worst possible outcome socially. You see, so that person who thought they were gonna be better is now gonna be worse off in the long run because maybe that person, you know, just stretching this further. If everyone behaved this way in every domain, economically, that person might be out of a job for another few weeks long. Suddenly they have way less money, they have less toilet paper. Like it, it doesn't, it's the short run, long run kind of problem. Uh, and that people can't see, they don't have the foresight. And well, some people do, I'm just saying, humans in general struggle to really see the long run and the long-term uh, picture. And they all struggle to embrace what is probably gonna be the best for the collective because of very instinctive um, biological uh, urges and, and, and desires, um, and such as to preserve, you know, preserve everything you need to keep your family safe. Um, yeah, of course. Well, self-preservation is one of the hallmarks of our existence. So you can see why people have that urgency to want to do that. Mm -hmm. And I also think that amplified by the context in which it's taking place. I mean, you're being told to isolate, to stay at home. And instinctively, that makes you think about your household. I mean, even the way the legislation is framed, you know, you stay within your household. There's no kind of cross-contamination there. So that focus of the self-preservation, do this, so that you can stay isolated. I think it amplifies our sense of lacking compassion because you're thinking about the short term, the individual, their family, and it promulgates, I think, this selfishness that we're seeing in, in society. Yeah, exactly. And, and it's almost like, the you know, how we moved off from that kind of political dimension. It's almost like just the way the environment's set up right now. It's such mm. it kind of really plays into that power imbalance even more because Everything is set up in a way that, especially with those self, that instinct to, to self-preserve, to protect your, only your domestic sphere. Don't think about other people out there. Don't think about the greater collective good. Though all the incentives that are aligned to just think about yourself, right, are causing people to view others as that, you know, the other, uh, to demonize others, right? So you're actually mm -hmm. starting to have this negative view of others rather than really truly being in it as a collective. Now, we're not saying this is everyone, 
it's just you we everyone's seen all these little clips we've seen footage it's exposing the this duality in our human nature right and and, and again that that's, that is might only be embodied on a collective front but even individually you know i feel these things you feel conflicted at times there are inconsistent motivations here at play and you see that with people um being you know we've seen people being super racist on uh we've seen video footage of that we've seen people literally physically fighting you know in supermarkets over goods uh hordes of people you know it, it's quite comical at times not the violent stuff but the you, you see people in these supermarkets i saw this video of literally uh <laughs> People that people working at Coles or Woolies or something literally launching toilet paper into crowds like like it was some merchandise. Yeah. They're like yeah. like it was like it's a, a you know like the Australian Open and it's you know Federer Roger Federer throwing a tennis ball up. That's how that's how people it, it, people just get so consumed in this this very scarce mindset. Yes, of course, but I also think, like, to add on to that, the kinds of representations that we've seen of humans in these contexts has been conducive to demonising people. Yeah. I think the media is more selective in the kinds of examples that they represent about human nature and the fact that they're showing these comical but also very poor reflections of our human nature and our behaviour is also conducive to making sure that people stay isolated because, I mean, why would you want to integrate when we know that people are acting in such ridiculous ways? So it's, yeah, it's kind of very selective. The context, the context is very conducive to these sorts of behaviour. But I guess my point is, is that these representations, the context itself and the health crisis is kind of making people act in a selfish way, arguably to the extent that it's almost out of their control. Yeah, yeah, I agree. That, that's an interesting point. And, and that plays into that broader concern we raised about the media and, of course, what's going to sell more, what's going to get more uh, interest and attention. It, it's the negative stuff. It's always been negatives. And that's the mm -hmm. challenge for any individual and for any society. It, you know, if you want to thrive, you have to transcend those negative portrayals. You have to be kind of beyond what the media nitpicks because they're, they're just in it to show the worst of us because that is really what is going to keep attention. That's what's going to sell attention. But if we were just showing all the positives and there's so much good stuff happening out there now, you know, like everyone in, in the health uh, industry, teachers out there, people who are on the front line actually uh, dealing with the infection um, head on. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if they showed only that, of course, of course, some of the other stuff, you know, needs to be raised every now. But if it was a proportionate portrayal, it, it would probably be far more, you know, you'd hope it'd probably be far more towards the good side of human nature. Uh, but funnily enough, as they definitely skew that uh, far more heavily towards the negative uh, depiction of our nature, uh, as you say, it, like it feeds further into our fear. We're, we're saying, wow, we're capable of this. Like, uh, I really do need to be careful of that other person. And it's like, th that's only a very small minority who are doing that mm. but again they do represent that it's still on that spectrum of what we're capable of and, and of course the media and, and as students of history and, and whatnot you always focus on those extremes uh, because they they certainly show the the worst of us they show the kind of the worst case scenario which is what people are naturally inclined to be interested in the most that's that's right. And there's an extent, perhaps, of the subconscious mirroring of that poor behaviour that we see, right? When we see all of those people flock to Bondi and people displaying behaviour that's lacking so deeply in compassion, well, then why will I care if I take all the toilet paper and there is none left for anybody else, right? Because who am I really leaving it for? I think there's a little bit of an element of that as well. Yeah, but, and, and that's it. That's, that's the scarcity and that's the, that's the, that's the lose-lose mentality, right? That, that, mm. that is so easily to fall into, but it's in our best interest to still act, you know, in the, for the win-win, the win-win mm. play. Um, as to what the what the win-win scenario is, it's not always even clear. Uh, it's certainly not clear now, right? Uh, if, if we just talk about, like, what is the best thing to do right now for the, the people of Australia? You know, obviously, we have experts and we have um, elected representatives to make those big calls. Uh, and I think it's good that we do that because that's the only way something of this magnitude could be handled. You have to entrust mm people uh you know at the top the hierarchy has value there you can't just leave it for everyone to figure it out by themselves this this issue is too big um and i was just going to say as well slight tangent here but the idea of this issue being so big it, it's interesting isn't it it's it's this idea of it being such a subtle invisible force uh something that is really out of our control that's out of our sight uh there, there's something there that is very humbling for us uh, you know as a, as a as the human race yeah. there's what a touch yeah, that you're so vulnerable to this concept, right? This concept of COVID, yeah. That's right. And this idea of it being almost non-discriminant in, in 
in who it attacks. And we know that some, some cohorts are more vulnerable uh, to serious or susceptible to serious illness as a result. We know that some people are more likely to actually contract it. But, but overall, we're seeing that anyone can get the, it certainly doesn't discriminate on the basis of wealth. Uh, and, mm. and it doesn't seem to discriminate on the basis of race as far as I know or anything like that. Um, oh, yeah. really yes, just to add on to that, I think a fact that reinforces that point is the kinds of areas where the COVID is most prevalent, right? Being the more affluent areas in Sydney, I think that's potentially a sign of ignorance in certain parts of um, certain suburbs and the fact that it's gravitating towards and maybe kind of shows that no, it has no discrimination towards gender, race, social class, sexuality or any of the above. Yeah, go on. Yeah, that's right. And, and there's something humbling about that. And there's something that, you know, out of this kind of, crisis as they're calling it out of this crisis out of this event in this really kind of significant and unique event in history you know we're living through a really significant time um and this you know this period will be studied which is really interesting this will be studied in like 100 years presumably right yeah, uh, it's that. This is and, a new, yep, go on. yeah sorry yeah it'll be called like the post covid world right you know it's the post-war like the post-modernism is done now it's it's another one coming right um so Anyway, I'll, I'll, I don't probably have something to say about that. But um, I was going to say th this will be studied. But there's something that really positive, in a, in a sense, could come out of this. Now, I don't mean that in any. Uh, that's not with any insensitivity towards people whose families are affected and, and whatnot. About that, that's just saying on a collective level, as we kind of move forward, once this thing is done, right, or, or at least done in the sense that we don't have to impose. Uh, the, the restrictions that we have now, right? I'm sure this will linger for, for years, right? This, this virus will still be around, but hopefully we're in a position where we can contain it. So until we reach that, once we reach that point of containment, maybe on this kind of uh, more meta physical level, like in terms of the collective consciousness, we, we might be heightened in that sense. And we might actually be humbled by the experience and realize that we all are the same fundamentally. Um, and this is one example of where we're almost equally vulnerable. Uh, in a sense. To yeah, think I agree. I agree with that point. But I also think it's actually very saddening that it takes a disease or a sickness that affects the, I guess, the, the hegemonic figure, that being, you know, the upper class white man, the fact that he is affected by this disease, that that's what brings so much hysteria and I want to get it down. Because, I mean, there are lots of other forms of sickness or disease or if we even think about starvation in certain parts of the world that affect a very significant portion of people. But it's only because you have something that is non-discriminatory and affects people that we arguably value more in society, unfortunately, than certain other groups that makes us act out in hysteria and want to act out against it. So I think, yeah, okay, it is very humbling. Yep, no matter what social class you're from or gender and so on, that this is something that will attack you and you realise that your power is only very limited. It also is kind of a wake up call of how ignorant we can be. And it's only when certain powerful people can be affected by something that we actually give it a significant amount of attention. Yeah, that's right. Definitely. So, and that plays into the point that it's exposing a lot about us, where, where, and it, but it's only through the perspective that it provides. So I'm kind of just saying from a more optimistic lens, looking ahead, once we deal with this and we see, and we are humbled hopefully by this, uh, it's a shame that it has to take this, but that's human nature. Like we just, we do oh, segment yeah. each other up to this. We, we aren't all uh, treated equally and we don't all have the same opportunity. That's just the, the sad reality. Hopefully over time, people have, have more and more, of, of the same opportunities um, to thrive in life. But uh, hopefully at the end of the tunnel, there's light at the end of the tunnel there, some, op some kind of global optimistic perspective uh, that we come out of it with a little bit more uh, humility and a little bit more respect for each other. And yeah. And I think gratitude in general for the simpler parts of our existence, right? Little things like being able to socialise or go to restaurants or being able to get together in public places. I think there's a heightened sense of gratitude. I really take for granted all of the last times I went out and saw my friends. I think that's another point as well to add to the humility. Yes, yes, 100%. Yeah, becoming grateful for um, things like that and, and, just the, and just the freedom of movement and, and to walk around in groups. Like it, it goes all the way down to, to that kind of minutia. Uh, in terms of what we really should be grateful for and those, those freedoms and liberties that we can take for granted at times. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, look, I think, I think there's some really good points. I was going to raise something else on that, uh, which, oh, the other thing is, and, and, I, and I, it was a really good point I heard, I was listening to a podcast on this and a really good point raised was this is how a lot of people, um, 
live generally day to day. Like this, like this, this isn't even an issue for some people. Like this is just the norm for some for some cohorts, some for some groups of people in the world, right? Yeah. Like like people, uh, and I, I, you know, I don't know exactly who is experiencing exactly this, but the point is this type of thing of living in these, first of all, with these kind of political restrictions imposed upon them. Some people mm. live like that every day. I, I, you know, I don't know what's going on in North Korea these days, but, but it seems like they're on a, these kind of totalitarian regimes and, and people who are even close to that kind of dictatorship where the government can just come and take away your freedom. This is how some people are living every day anyway, right? That's the first yeah. thing. Of course, of course. I mean, there's a there's a kind of element of slavery that could be analysed. There's could be a potentially a gendered lens that you could take to this. I mean, if you think about the maternal role that is subsumed by a lot of women, that they are stuck within domesticity and they're raising a child, and there's a self-imposed sense of social distancing. There are many examples that you can think of where this is a reality for a lot of people divorced from the specifically political lens. I think you can think of a lot of different examples there. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And, and, and health-wise as well, the, the presence of disease in some communities around the world, um, I won't specify any, but we, we know there's some, and there's people who are living in those third world conditions. Like that, I, I think the, the way that I heard it explained is this is like a, this is a developed world or a first world problem. Like the third world already have these kinds of problems. They have these think. problems of disease and, and yeah. malnutrition and things that are so much worse than what, what this virus even is proving to be on average, right? Which is what I was saying earlier on. It's only because this is now affecting people that are of upper classes and that, who are of a certain right. race that it's become such a global issue. But yeah, I think this is definitely, these sorts of circumstances and living conditions are an endemic circumstance that are faced by people in developing worlds, for sure. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, but it's not even just the upper class. I don't want to discriminate myself. It's, it's the upper class of the world, which is the all the advanced economies, all the OECD. It's not, it's more macro than that. It's more, it's not just the upper class pockets of those communities. But you can zoom in and find even more disparity there, of course. Of course, of course. But I think it's very metonymic for the kind of concept that you're dealing with here, that from that developed perspective, yeah, it's an issue that is now newly considerable to that part of the world compared to the developing portions. Yeah, we, and, and again, something kind of almost positive there in that we can gain some empathy for the fear and also the health uh, issues that are faced by many communities generally and, and in many pockets of the world that are often neglected. So perhaps that, again, that heightened awareness, heightened consciousness of these issues, uh, there might be yeah. some kind of unifying uh, to come of this. You know, just looking at this from a more long-term optimistic uh, point of view. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, I've got a question for you, actually. I was just thought of it. As I said that, we're entering that new kind of paradigm, right? Um, do you, so what do you think about, you know, literature and things like that um, kind of after this event? Do you think there will be this new class, like, a, you know, the, the post-COVID kind of way of thinking that, that could be characterised by a label, you know, equivalent to postmodernism? I'm not too sure. I'm not too sure that it's distinctly dissimilar to the way that Atwood perhaps writes a text like Handmaid's Tale or Miller writes The Crucible or George Orwell writes 1984 because at the heart of this, you see a re-conceptualisation of human experience, you see a reframing of being subject to certain sorts of restrictions, the importance of human connection, values of desire, identity. I think all of these resonating qualities that come out in this context hark back to texts that have been written not only in the last 60 or so years, but also kind of historically it is a little bit of an instance of history repeating itself i think the spanish plague is probably the most synonymous situation to what we have right now so i think to an extent yeah okay a post covid sort of literary realm i don't know that something like that would exist i think postmodernism is still a very resonating way like in terms of literary what was that oh sorry i was just asking so so in your opinion this kind of is exactly what postmodernism would account for well, I don't know that it's specific to postmodernism. So when I think about postmodernism, I think more about form. I think about how texts have been constructed. And I think some of those elements can continue to be used irrespective of the historical aspect, the historical elements here being covered. I'm not sure that would trigger a change in the way that texts have been written. But I'm, ter I'm talking in terms of the kinds of ideas that texts are portraying, that those ideas that are specific to this contextual circumstance aren't new ideas. Um, and the fact that we say that they're kind of being recycled 
cycle is actually quite a testament to postmodernism, right? Postmodernism really heralding this idea that there is no original way of telling something that has already been told in another text. So that intertextual element, I think, holds true. It kind of reinforces the central tenets of postmodernism in terms of form. But I think the ideas that will be raised because of this coronavirus circumstance are ideas which lie at the kind of heart of human existence. They're perennial questions of our existence that have certainly been dealt with in previous crisis eras. Yeah, there's some great points. Um, lots to take away from that. Um, yeah. So, no, I, I agree with you, especially on that kind of form basis, I guess. I guess when it first came up, I thought, I suppose you, and you, I suppose you can't tell whether, you don't know until it's happened, really, whether the new form, a new kind of style or form that will become characteristic of literature will emerge, right? Uh, it's kind of hard to say, oh, yeah. but, but I certainly, yeah. um, that, that makes a lot of sense with what you're saying about the cyclical nature and how this is just a, an event that has been kind of regurgitated out of history uh, and we've seen it before and Interestingly enough, and we'll, we'll probably jump into that now, um, unless you have any further comments, but when we look at some texts like The Crucible, a lot of these texts uh, in, their, in their nature, in their form, are actually pointing to the cyclical nature of these kinds yeah. of events. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so did you want to start off with The Crucible as a textual yeah, example? Well, yeah, so maybe, maybe we'll do a few minutes on each. Um, on, we'll do a few minutes on the big text, so we might look at The Crucible, 1984. We're also going to talk about Merchant, yeah, we can points about Merchant. I think obviously 84 and Crucible are the clearest synonymous historical circumstances to what we're encountering now. But on a more base human level, I think Merchant of Venice, Billy Elliot and Pastor Shallows, they have some more kind of resonating qualities about human emotions, relationships that can, I guess, be examined through our contemporary lens. So I guess our point here, and a point that is resonating throughout the entire video, is that this context in which we're currently placed also illuminates how we can connect with previous historical circumstances. So it's not just, I guess, saying that, oh, what Miller was talking about is what's happening right now. Well, it's more than that. It's kind of like, wow, we can now empathize and appreciate previous historical periods to a heightened lens because there are some resonating qualities between what was experienced then and, and what's happening right now. Yeah, that, that's, um, that's such an interesting point. Um, I'll just get rid of that on the screen. That's an interesting point. It, do you, like, there's a question of whether we need to live through these periods that are talked about in some of these texts to truly get the message, right? Because these yeah. texts... Yeah, I, yeah, that's right. I think obviously tread really lightly on that because I'm not saying that having to stay at home and work from home is something that's synonymous to a Jewish person's experience in the Holocaust. Like that would be a really gross kind of analogy to then draw. But I do think that elements of experiencing a sense of control or your liberties being restrained to an extent help you perhaps understand why Winston so desperately wanted to have an affair with Julia and the symbolic value of that affair and those elements of desire in that text, right? So I'm saying through kind of self-reflection, there is a maybe greater scope to empathise with what previous composers were conveying within their texts. Yeah, that's right. There's just this interesting, and it's not to compare any particular historical event to, to anything in the present, it's just to say when a message, especially a cautionary one, when you, when you read a cautionary tale, there's this added dimension now that we have, uh, again, not to say that the subject matter or the magnitude of the event is in any way similar, but there is a sense of now we have some kind of lived human experience ourselves. And, and a lot of the time schools yeah. get uh, students to think about lived human experience and they try to get them to relate it. And I'm saying now you have a lived human experience of a significant magnitude that you can then project onto your understanding of these previous representations of other similar in a way or different, but just equivalent in the sense of crises and, and, and uh, you know, trauma in a sense as well in, that we're exploring in other yeah. texts. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And like I said earlier on, it also just speaks to, and I know it's a repeated and broad point, but the enduring value of the text that you study, right? This particular circumstance points to the fact that reading those texts continue to hold value because there are continued connections that can be made. But yeah, did you want to start off with um, The Crucible? Yes. So in making connections to The Crucible, uh, we'll go through a couple of points and we can just go back and forth on them. I mean, something significant of course, is this idea of collective conformity and the cost of not conforming. Uh, we saw in the Crucible how 
people who do not conform to the mandate that is imposed upon them are actually demonized and quite literally demonized as a witch. They're, they're told that they are the other. And we saw, this, we saw this text come out of the Cold War where that kind of term of the other became really pronounced. And yeah, the meaning I think, that to add to that, I think an interesting point though to add to that is that Miller was using the Salem witch trials, right, a historical period prior to that. So I guess what we're encountering now is reinforcing that point of history repeating itself, right? We're kind of looking retrospectively back to Miller whilst Miller was looking retrospectively back to the Salem witch trials. So there's this kind of third tier that's now appearing. Yes. But yes, go on. No, absolutely. And, and that's, that's another key point as well, that the cyclicality of these events and, right. and the idea of history repeating itself and that being demonstrated through the allegorical form of the text itself. Uh, that is that's the crucible. Right. Um, so that's a really important point that, that anyone should take away from this. You know, if you're looking at the crucible, um, that's definitely another key point. Um, the other one on in terms of the other and, and demonizing people who don't conform to the status quo, we're just seeing the potential for that to kind of manifest now. We're, we're seeing it in many different ways, actually. Uh, first of all, you can look at it from a legal perspective. You can look at it from a civil rights perspective. You can look at how people who are not doing the right thing right, are kind of demonized by each other, people who uh, step the boundaries of, of what is socially acceptable in this time, really are, you know, you see physical violence break out, you see people accusing other people um, of, of certain things, and, and there is this kind of social tension between people in the collective. And of course. Of course. is yeah. a, sorry, I'll just, I'll just finish the sentence, and then you go, but um, there, there is that, that sense of, by doing that, by creating this kind of demonization of people who step out of line, Right, and by having the police there to enforce it, and by having the media, to, you know, uh, not not that they had, not that we saw like the media necessarily, but we see it. it the media is just a way of proliferating information, right, of getting information out, and, and we see that in the crucible as well. That the more the hysteria kind of emerges and widens, right, the more people become fearful of each other, and the more that people uh, are, which I should say, are compelled to actually blame other people if they feel like they're doing the wrong thing they'll say oh I was only doing it because of that person and, and that kind of blame game and, and demonization of each other is something that really weakens the collective and that actually will prevent the collective from coming back from any exploitation of power by by the uh you know the higher powers the the, the government or whatever or the uh kind of in, in that in that sense it was the, the theocratic value system right the people at the top of the theocracy uh, and the people who were enforcing that you saw the judges that had the power as well um, those kind of people, you're not going to get your power back too easily if everyone has been turned against one another and everyone is afraid of people and everyone is compelled to uh, demonize anyone who steps out of line. Rather, people should be compassionate, people should be empathetic, people should be assisting each other and people should maintain the truth, right? Um, so when, when people actually start believing things that they know perhaps aren't too true, because they've become, their consciousness has become really suppressed by the fear and all the messages and they stop questioning things and they start genuinely believing things that if they rationally and consciously considered, they would know not to be true. Once they start perpetuating those lies and those stories, those false narratives, that's when everything kind of crumbles. And we saw that there. I'm not saying it's happened here, but there's certainly the, um, we're seeing the, the seeds of that present and we just have to hope that we respond in a, in a positive way and get through it.